Okay, good morning, everybody. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Interior Health Research Week. My name is Kim Peek, and I work with the IH Research Department and the BC Support Unit Interior Centre as a research navigator and community facilitator. I am deeply grateful to be living, loving, and learning on the traditional and unceded territories of the beautiful Silk Nation. Let us take the first few moments to acknowledge all the traditional and unceded territories where we have the honor to be today. And I invite everyone to please share the names of these lands in the chat box. If you do not know the names, please take a moment to explore the link, native-land.ca. I will also provide this link in the chat just a few moments. Please share after you've learned. It is truly a great honor to introduce two Silk Okanagan, sorry, two Silk, yes, Okanagan Nation knowledge keepers residing in West Bank First Nation that would be providing us with a territory welcome and some opening words. Thank you, Elder Pamela. Uh, the spotlight is yours. Lim Lim. So uh, my name is Pamela Barnes. My ancestral name is Chuchiwaskit which means the coming of a storm or the coming of change. Um, I just need to um, make apologies for Grouse. He's not um, with me unless he makes it in the door in the next few minutes, but he was called away on another urgent matter. Um, so he may or may not make it, I'm not sure. So we, um, we cover for each, for each other on a regular basis. So. Um, so it's my honor today to um, welcome you to the traditional territory of the Silks people. And in doing that, um, I just want to clarify a few things. So thank you for the land acknowledgement. And I just want to start by clarifying the difference between a land acknowledgement and a welcome to our territory. So a land acknowledgement is something that everyone should be doing. And it's a really simple matter of uh, manners in um, recognizing your host. Here in this part of Turtle Island, um, you know, we've never signed treaties. We've never um, sold our lands or gave them away or traded them. And so the reality is that uh, you're guests in our home. And so it's proper protocol and manners to just recognize that. Just like the president of the United States, if he were visiting or she would um, acknowledge Canada as the host, but it wouldn't be appropriate for the president of the United States to welcome others to Canada. That would be the role of the prime minister. And so that's the, the role that I'm sitting in today in welcoming you to our traditional territory. So I first really want to impress upon you what our relationship is to our, our lands. So we, we see ourselves as borrowing these lands from the future. These lands are made up of the blood and the bones of our ancestors for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's all sacred to us. And we recognize that we are only here but a moment in time. And so we recognize that what we are here protecting um, we have a responsibility to future generations of, for the land, for the water, and for all living things. And there's a really big difference between that idea and the ideas that newcomers have brought of human ownership of land. So I have this um, hair clip. Now, if I own this hair clip, it's mine. I can sell it, I can trade it, I can give it away. I can take really good care of it or I can toss it aside. It's mine, I can do what I want with it. 
But as soon as I borrow this, everything about that relationship changes. I can't sell it. I can't trade it. I can't give it away. It's not mine. There's an expectation that I take the very best care that I possibly can. And that when I leave it or return it, that it's at least in the same condition that I found it in. And if at all possible, better. So it's with this understanding that we first welcomed people to the traditional territory of the Sioux people. And about 200 years ago. And it's with this understanding that I welcome you today to the traditional, unceded, and currently occupied territory of the Sioux people. With the urgent reminder that none of us, including ourselves as Sioux people, are doing the very best job possible to take care of this land, this water, and all of the life for all future generations, for all of our children, all of our grandchildren, all of our great-grandchildren, and so on and so forth. So, Lin Lin. Um, I would like to thank the creator for allowing us all to be here today. And just to recognize that, you know, we're in a, in a time of uh, change out on the land. It's getting cooler, is there's more moisture, there's more rain, which is very welcome always because it's good for the plants and the animals and our medicines, but especially this year, with the drought that we've had, with the fires that we've had, it's all very necessary. Um, this time of year, you know, we've been out on the land, we've gathered our roots, we've gathered our berries and medicines, we've done our fishing, we're doing our hunting. And these are things that we've always done and things that we continue to do. And we're moving in closer to that time when, uh, you know, we will be traditionally, we would have been returning to our, our winter homes. Um, and so I just um, acknowledge uh, today and that we're all here and we're all meant to be here and that we have important work to do and important things to, to talk about and share. And that I uh, my wish is that we that everyone has a very productive week um, with everything that's in front of you. So, Lim Lim. Thank you so much, Elder Pamela. Um, and thank you for being here today and thank you for your wise words. And uh, I really do, and I'm sure others do as well, appreciate the, the education in the beginning as well. Um, this thank you and I have to uh, say that your your uh, background um, tapestry is beautiful thank you uh, and with that wonderful beginning um, it's an, a sincere honor and pleasure to introduce IH leaders Dr. Devin Harris who's the executive medical director with the quality patient safety and research portfolios and Dr. D. Taylor, Corporate Director with the IH Research Department, to say a few words to also begin the week's events. You guys have the spotlight. Thank you. Maybe I'll go uh, first. Can you hear me all right? Thumbs, thumbs up, folks. Good. Thanks, everyone. So um, just first of all, um, thank you, Elder Barnes, for that those beautiful words. Um, the reminder that we are guests uh, on this land, that the acknowledgement that we provide of the territory is to be done in, in a good way and with good in, intention. So just, um, just really appreciate you getting us started off and, and your very, very wise words. 
Um, so hello everybody. As Kim said, I'm Dee Taylor. I'm the Corporate Director of Research for Interior Health. I also hold um, a co-scientific director uh, position with the Rural Coordination Centre of BC. And I draw on both of these uh, today to, to offer you welcome. I'm coming to you uh, from my home office, which is located in the rural community of Eagle Bay. It's located along the beautiful Shushwap Lake in the unceded and un ancestral territory of the Shwetmet people near to Adams Lake Band. So I'm here to talk to you and welcome you for uh, to our 2021 annual research week. And research is about asking questions, questions that matter to people. In healthcare, there has been a long standing sense of having certainty in terms of how to be and what to do. And COVID, to say the least, has disrupted that sense of certainty. But it has also taught us to deal with uncertainty, embrace it, and change and search for new ways of being and what to do. Research and its quest for the question leverages networks of knowledge and uses rigorous methods to find answers. This is at the heart of interior health research. By using the research process, we see where we don't know, where we are not certain. We collaborate with others who are looking at similar problems and searching for answers. In doing so, we learn from others. We embrace new ways of knowing and see opportunities to improve what we do and how we do it. And we do so with the goal of improving care and the health and wellness of our people and communities. So again, I welcome you to our research week. We have an absolutely impressive lineup of presenters for you throughout the week. And I really do appreciate you joining us. Thank you and over to you, Dr. Harris. Hey, thanks. Um, and thank you, Elder Pamela and, um, uh, and Gross as well, who um, I wasn't able to be here. Um, I also want to recognize, I come, I'm speaking to you from Okanagan Silex Territory in beautiful Kelowna today and want to recognize and acknowledge that we're collectively gathered on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of seven interior region First Nations where we live, learn, collaborate and work together. And many of you have, have put that down in the chat as well. So thank you. Uh, region is also home to 15 chartered Métis communities. And it's with humility that we continue to strengthen our relationships with First Nations, Métis and Inuit people within the interior. So thank you. My name is Devin Harris. I'm an emergency physician in Kelowna Hospital. I'm Executive Medical Director of Quality Patient Safety and Research. I'm the uh, chair of the BC Patient Safety Quality Council, and I'm a clinical professor with the Department of Emergency Medicine, um, Faculty of Medicine at UBC. I became interested in research um, when I worked uh, in the Lower Mainland at St. Paul's Hospital, uh, where I felt I wasn't able to provide um, best care for stroke patients who had come through the emergency department in St. Paul's. And so through a series of uh, work that um, gradually progressed into an interest in stroke research was um, uh, introduced to a researcher within Toronto who was developing a, a novel therapy for treatment of stroke that could be administered very early on in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, saw this presented at a conference in Toronto and um, I and others approached him to say would it be worthwhile or beneficial to spread this to BC where we might have an opportunity to apply this or to trial it in BC as well. At the time I lived in Vancouver and the trial started there but when I moved to Kelowna, the question was asked, why not have the trial run in Kelowna or be uh, performed in Kelowna? And when I came here in 2014, that was an impossibility. Uh, there wasn't the infrastructure to support it. Uh, there wasn't the ability to do so. And we didn't have the significant number of view people who were around to be able to support a trial such as that. Fast forward to 2021, uh, the Frontier Clinical Trial, a neuroprotectant trial, uh, is the fastest enrolling site of any of the sites within uh, British Columbia for enrolling people. And the byproduct of research, as what Dee alluded to, was the vision in which this was originally thought to bring to BC. With this, it trained paramedics in the understanding and recognition of stroke. And so the impact was much further and far reaching than the administration of a, a potential therapy in a clinical trial setting. The education that went into that, the training, the awareness, uh, the training that then went into the transport physician's understanding has had much larger impact on overall stroke care than research by itself. And that really is where and how we're thinking about research as the um, catalyst for change and one in which we can provide a significant impact for the healthcare system overall uh, by investigating what we do and all of the um, fantastic side effects 
uh, and impact that comes with the development of research infrastructure. When I moved in 2014 here, there was um, limited research department, very limited clinical trial support. So now going from two full-time staff to 39 staff who are working in some capacity with many of you, uh, we have ballooned in people. Uh, annual funding around $2 million with respect to clinical trial support. And specific studies, we had 82 studies last year that were put through research ethics. Now I have 245 active studies, of which 27 are specifically grant-funded clinical trials as well. So it's incredibly impressive, impressive the research that goes on in interior health. We've also realized, and we've taken this on very clearly, that it is not ivory tower. Research is relevant. Uh, and research, uh, as you've seen and you will see, uh, into adolescent mental health, cardiac care, rehabilitation, is relevant and important to patients and families. We've developed and have significant partnerships with UBCO, Southern Medical Program, TRU, Academic Health Sciences Network, the Rural Coordination Center of British Columbia, and, our found, and through our foundations, the public and, and public members who have impact into what we research and what really is important to patients and families. We have the opportunity for research that is focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is incredibly important for rural and remote care, for chronic diseases, for indigenous research, and for the environment and environmental impact around communities and families as well. We are not Vancouver, we are not Calgary, and we are immensely proud that we are not because this is what's important globally, what we are looking at, and this is the most impact that's gonna have on healthcare is what we research within interior health. It's pragmatic, it's real world research. And truthfully, you within research lead innovation for the health authority. You are the innovation engine for the health authority. We have partnerships with private industry to investigate impact and health system changes. So in closing, I really do wanna thank the research department and my dyad, Dr. D. Taylor, for her leadership and vision within this program. And for all of you incredible research leaders, mentors, and champions, we do have the significant attention of our senior executive and leadership team within the Health Authority, and much further than that, provincially now and also nationally. I wanna extend the congratulations on behalf of uh, Dr. Mike Hertel, um, our VP of Medicine and Quality, who couldn't be here as there's board meetings for the next two days, but he also wants to send his congratulations uh, and uh, wish you a fantastic research week as well. I look forward to participating and learning with you. Uh, and we give you the consent to research, ask questions and test, and we'll do our best to be able to support you in all these fantastic questions you have. Thank you very much. Enjoy the week. Thank you both Dr. Harris and Dr. Taylor for you're also setting us off on the right foot that elder Pamela started us on. Most appreciated. And we are ahead of schedule by 13 minutes, which is always impressive and, uh, and always uh, points to Dee's leadership of always making sure we are on schedule. So uh, with that, I, I'm gonna request a pause because we are just waiting for our speaker to join um, because she's probably coming exactly at me. So we have 13 minutes, sorry, 12 minutes now, where uh, please feel free to get a drink of water, have a bio break, whatever you need to do in the meantime, and we'll have a short pause until the presentation starting at noon. Thanks everyone.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for that uh, minor intermission. So a few housekeeping, so welcome to those that have just joined to IH Research Week 2021. Uh, my name is Kim Peek and I work with both the IH Research Department and the BC Support Unit Interior Centre. I'm deeply grateful to be living, loving and learning on the traditional and unceded territories of the beautiful Seals Nation. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to write in the chat where you have the honor to be located today. And if you're not sure which lands you reside on or are on today, please go to native-land.ca. The link is at the very top of the attendee chat and you can share after you've learned. Uh, the, a few housekeeping items is please note that the chat box will be disabled throughout the presentation. But at the end of the presentation, we open up time for a question and answer, for a question and answer period, where you can ask questions through the chat box and, and communicate with the presenter or presenters. Uh, every presentation throughout this week will be recorded and links to these recordings will be sent to you directly when they're posted online through the emails you provided through your registration. So uh, without further ado, it's a true honor and pleasure to introduce the first a presentation today titled The Cost of Racism in Healthcare Delivery in Rural British Columbia. The presenter is Dr. Terry Aldrett, who has many hats, including being a valued rural community physician, a UBC clinical instructor for the Faculty of Medicine, and as a medical director for the First Nations Health Authority. I had the pleasure to get to know Terry during our uh, writing community of practice, where the RCCBC team came together to uh, start co-writing a paper on this research. Her compassion and passion for rural health equity is, is very evident in her day-to-day -day work. And with that, the spotlight is on you, Dr. Aldred. Thank you, Kim, for the kind introduction. And Hadith, everyone, my name is Terry Aldred. I'm Dad Kath from Crosden. I'm a member of the Soul Youth Frog Fun on my mom's side and on my dad's side, I'm Métis Cree and mixed European. Um, and I'm calling in today from the traditional territory, otherwise known, uh, the traditional territory of the Clay Lake Tanae First Nations, otherwise known as Prince George, um, where, um, yeah, where I have many cousins and aunts um, that um, call this traditional territory home. Um, and um, my uh, class den is located just north of Fort St. James, um, which is about two and a half hours northwest of here. Um, and I've lived all over the northwest. I'm a family doc uh, by trade, um, and I still do my clinical work with Care Sakan Family Services, uh, which our primary care team serves 12 First Nations communities across North Central uh, BC. And um, I also hold a few roles with the Rural Coordination Center, as well as UBC as the site director for the Indigenous Family Medicine Program, and as the medical director for primary care for FNAJ. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> I was the lucky person um, uh, from our group to come and present to you today. I know we have a, a couple um, of our other um, members um, viewing, um, and so I will just jump right in. <clears throat> Hopefully, I can get a few things to work. So hopefully everyone can see that okay, and hopefully my audio is good as well. Um, so we started working um, last summer on um, uh, the paper that I'm going to talk to you about um, that kind of bore out of um, the uh, announcement of the allegations of racism in the emergency room. Um, that people were playing a, a game um, in emergency departments around um, estimating blood alcohol levels of First Nations individuals. Um, and in my role with the Rural Cremation Center, there was a, a group of us who were just talking about um, how we can, you know, use um, this call to action to um, move this work forward and in many different realms of our work, um, whether it was with the site visit project, which is um, where the data for this project came from, um, or with developing 
um, indigenous um, indigenous health um, curriculum or cultural safety and humility, anti-racism approaches um, into our programs and um, how things were delivered um, and that sort of thing, really wanting to um, use this as an impetus to, you know, to not just um, have a statement about how um, we are anti-racist and want to promote anti-racism and healthcare, but also to um, have really concrete and meaningful action and next steps. And so one of those came from the fact that um, in the site visit project, um, while people were um, engaging with conversations uh, with both First Nations and non-First Nations health partners across rural BC, um, that uh, anti-Indigenous racism and cultural safety came up um, not infrequently, in fact, quite commonly. Um, and the thought was, how can we take the opportunity um, to look at that data to help um, kind of inform um, and shape next steps on how we can address um, anti-Indigenous racism, in particular in rural British Columbia. Um, so I have nothing to declare. <clears throat> and so I already started with a little bit of a background um, on this project. And so there have been um, numerous um, qualitative research um, in the past that has um, documented the adverse healthcare uh, experiences among Indigenous patients and the widespread negative stereotyping. Um, and that due to these experiences um, where when they access care, um, their experience um, was not positive, um, they would start to avoid care or present later and later, um, which adds to increased morbidity and mortality for Indigenous people. Um, and uh, in addition, um, as we started to work through this, um, um, they did uh, launch the investigation into those allegations of um, that game being played. Um, and it culminated, that um, investigation culminated into the release of the In Plain Sight report which also documents in details that racism is systemic and widespread um, across BC's healthcare system. <clears throat> and <clears throat> yeah, and so um, when Indigenous people experience um, the healthcare that they receive is not culturally appropriate, um, there have been um, some research um, that also has linked that to certain conditions like increased rates of diabetes, um, as well as poorer health outcomes um, and then um, in a number of domains, usually due to um, avoiding care, um, not, um, not presenting uh, or not following up, um, and also um, with ongoing struggles with things like uh, communication and, and that sort of thing. Um, looking at it from a trauma-informed perspective, this would make sense as people when they are, you know, when they're coming into environments that have um, a history of um, being traumatizing or re-traumatizing, um, then, <clears throat> then they can be a lot more activated. Um, and generally speaking, um, that experience is not very positive. So people will try to avoid um, having, having those feelings come up. Um, and in addition, with the history of colonization, residential schools, Indian hospitals, um, oftentimes these, um, these aversions to accessing care, um, you know, are, are multi-generational. And so our purpose, um, our aims, was to examine the experiences of anti-Indigenous racism across rural BC using data derived from the site visit project. Um, to help contribute to the body of lit literature documenting anti-Indigenous racism. Uh, in general, um, there, there isn't like um, data around racism uh, in particular, uh, like in healthcare is not, there's not a lot of it. Um, oftentimes in my other work, either uh, preparing for um, developing curriculum or lectures or things like that. I've done and been involved in a number of um, literature reviews and oftentimes we need to borrow from uh, 
uh, research and uh, published in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, um, as there isn't a lot, especially in Canada. Um, and even then, um, there's not a lot that's um, specific to anti-Indigenous racism. And there's a number of reasons for that um, that, um, that I could get more into. But to summarize, like, uh, racism historically hasn't been a very popular topic to research, so it's hard to get funding grants and different things um, to look into racism. Um, and then even if they do, it's actually really hard to publish on racism. Um, and it's really hard in general to um, design um, research studies and, um, and different things um, around racism and health outcomes um, just due to the, um, yeah, just due to the number of variables involved. Um, and so they, um, so there was a number of people through the Rural Coordination Center who are site visit um, the site visitors, so people who go in and lead um, the discussions in different rural communities. Um, that was funded by the Joint Standing Committee on Rural Issues. Um, and the purpose of these site visit projects was to engage rural communities to get a better insight into healthcare across rural BC. And while this project was not initially intended to focus on cultural safety and racism, um, the analysis of the data clearly revealed that this would be a prominent theme. Um, and due to um, the allegations of racism and the insight report, we thought it was timely for us to um, look at the data more closely um, and present it in a more timely manner. Um, right now, the site visit project is just over um, halfway completed, and so certainly um, more data around this um, will likely emerge as the project continues. Um, and so we thought that this was important because we wanted to highlight um, that racism has a serious um, and very real negative impact on patient care. Um, and we wanted to invite healthcare providers to reflect upon um, this impact and to work towards um, building, working towards their own cultural safety and, and humility journey and making concrete steps to cultural reconciliation. So the RCC site visit project uses a marketed methodology with an inclusive acquired approach. Um, and through our analysis, um, we wanted to incorporate as much indigenous methodologies into the paper as possible. Um, and so that included inviting an elder to help co write um, the paper, um, Dr. Cheryl Switzer. Um, and that was important for us to look at ourselves in the work um, and to understand how our worldviews will shape, um, shape how we um, work with the data and analyze and, and the ultimate outcome. Um, and uh, also that we wanted to engage with um, an external Indigenous review panel of um, Indigenous physicians, um, student presidents, um, and scholars to have a view of our paper uh, and draft form, um, and in particular to ensure first and foremost that um, the approach is um, not doing any harm and not perpetuating negative stereotypes and that sort of thing. Um, and um, and then also just to provide feedback on you know what permit points think that we can potentially pull or um, make bigger in various ways, um, and then things that maybe um, were less impactful. Um, and so. Um, and so we uh, did that through having a sharing circle with a group who were able to meet um, you know, all together virtually, of course, for the pandemic. Um, and then there was a few who couldn't attend and so provided um, written feedback to connect them one on one. Um, and um, so with this, um, we also uh, reviewed and followed up with the, with the ethics of the paper um, in that, you know, ensuring that um, our current ethics process um, and approval did cover um, uh, uh, publishing um, this data and that, you know, currently with our, our current consent process that the site visit leads um, collect from local communities would cover it. However, to be more explicit, um, it was, um, it was the process was approved by making it explicit um, to say that um, this data could be used um, to publish papers. Um, and so um, through, through the site visit project, we um, have um, ethics approval um, and um, it all the data, um, you know, after the consent process, all the data um, that we collect from the communities actually goes back to um, those provided it, including the First Nations communities. Um, they are uh, given the opportunity to review, um, edit, delete, um, uh, any other transcripts, and then once they kind of get their uh, sign off that they're okay with the data submitted, um, the data is anonymized um, and put into a process of Google, um, to kind of collect themes um, from that standpoint. So, um, so that the uh, individuals who um, shared some of these um, quotes and stories um, that they're um, that, yeah, that they're anonymous and their um, identity is protected. So, to data collection, so it occurred in semi structured interview guides um, and that followed OCAP principles. Um, and although the guide has, you know, um, in, has been built on and approved along the way um, as we reviewed data coming in, um, and so now the the semi structured interview guide um, always initially have questions um, that these mentioned related to safety and humanity and anti racism. Um, it now does uh, guide, um, guide discussions and help give um, much needed space to talk about this, uh, these topics. Uh, and so far, there's 382 interviews so far across 170 RSA communities. Um, and um, as I mentioned, um, we use a process within Google um, to help with the thematic analysis um, of, of the data being done. Um, reports are, um, are uh, released um, to all the community partners on a um, regular basis. And there's also a full, um, full report of the SV project methods um, published, um, so refer to um, that to that reference if you'd like to know more about the site visit project as a whole. So um, with the results, so we um, essentially um, through NVIVO, we, um, uh, we used, um, yeah, like searching for themes around cultural safety and humility, anti-racism, um, indigenous health, um, and that sort of thing to kind of pull out um, the site visit um, interviews that included um, discussions around those topics. Um, and then we um, uh, through uh, an 
here to process where the macabre discuss you know things that were coming up for us like pertinent quotes or pertinent themes um and then um as we were kind of documenting that um into um we kind of were able to comp and kind of distill um some of the, the pertinent um, data that we were seeing into these three distinct themes um so theme one was forms of racism in human healthcare theme two impacts of racism on healthcare and theme three steps was culturally safe healthcare uh, so in one form of racism in healthcare, so I'm going to take the time to actually read these quotes. Um, just um, I think um, one, another kind of way that we wanted to honor indigenous methodologies is that we didn't want to edit um, quotes um, from the original words um, too much. We wanted them to speak for themselves. Um, and so I think it's important to read those words and just um, have a pause to just see how they land. Uh, and so we broke down scheme one into um, data that related to systemic racism, epistemic racism, and interpersonal racism. Um, under systemic racism, what keeps me up at night too is the racism people suffer. I mean, the residential school for the region is right here. And so that is at, on the surface still and a very real experience for people that I still think we're not doing a great job of caring for. There's just so much trauma that falls from that. And then at people's health here when they wouldn't suffer if they had easier access to healthcare. And a lot of people tell me I'd rather stay found suffer and you know die uncomfortable here. And that's one of our indigenous community um, partner meetings. I think the pause is important and kind of just to register how that whole lands. Um, what, you know, things to reflect on are what emotions it stirs, what kind of thoughts come up um, being that quote. Epistemic racism. Our settler population don't really appreciate the history because they're, they've only been given it in one form. So we have been taught history in a certain way that is the perspective of the people who wrote the books, who are also settlers. We don't get a lot of, you know, indigenous historical material to reflect on to get the other perspective of the same events. And so, you know, we've got a lot of potential for education there for sure. Came struggling with addiction, and past historical trauma was never the main consideration at all. He told me, I went to the hospital and told that I was fine. The doctor didn't even see my chest. So I, uh, first mission soft director, went with him back to the hospital, and the difference he received in service was unbelievable. Okay. And so, um, oftentimes when we think of racism, a lot of what people think of is um, overt interpersonal racism, name calling, or um, even being physically violent towards somebody based on, um, based on their race. Um, but oftentimes, um, interpersonal racism may be more um, inadvertent, uh, maybe at home, maybe um, the way, um, like the subtle differences um, between how you may talk to a person in bedlam versus bed two. Um, and, uh, and so sometimes it can be hard to um, characterize at a time connect. Um, and in some of our other quotes, you know, we had people, um, because this was like a project, we talked to you know, not just administrators and community members, um, but also to physicians and um, also to um, mayors, um, people at the council, and we had people even being in our location. You know, that my hope is that you know, you can definitely like, it's hard for them to put their finger on it because they have that management to Experience someone was passing away at the hospital, and the nurses kicked everyone out and told them to go somewhere else. The family members, no matter how many nurses people, I don't know, gathers, you can't chew them away. You put them with their loved ones. Impact on patient care, trust being impaired. So, all these horrible experiences happen, and it's like in our community, so now you hesitate. Are they even going to take me seriously? Do I have to think about how dead people before they'll see me? Or, you know? Access to care. Many people have felt very strongly in the camp of the hospital, both in the emergency room, they've actually left sometimes and gone to other hospitals in the area because they felt, you know, that they weren't provided assistance. And so, um, a lot of these experiences of people in healthcare, um, or in the process of healthcare, um, also were highlighted in the incident report, documenting just the pervasive um, nature of racism in healthcare, and, and certainly in the site that it was, um, you know, it, it showed up in all regions of the province, um, and, and certainly, um, and so um, with this, I'm not talking about a few bad apples, um, we're talking about um, a systemic culture that um, in many ways um, perpetuates um, anti-indigenous racism. Theme three, steps towards culturally safe healthcare. And so um, with the site visit project, we also um, um, heard lots of um, uh, quote unquote good news stories about how um, you know steps that are being taken to address cultural safety in various healthcare settings and um, what occurred doesn't have to be um, say that medical people doing great work in area and there's um, really meaningful steps being taken um, towards um, providing more culturally safe healthcare to indigenous people. Um, and we broke these things down into four other steps relevant to this process and responsibility. Um, we also wanted to prove the relationship. There have been a number of, um, um, uh, I guess, four or five R's um, uh, models being developed that include, um, you know, different um, different R's, but a lot of them follow the same R respect to process and responsibility. Um, and in particular, to research the important points of relevance, so um, that you know that the work you know is, um, yeah, is relevant, is timely, is something that can be acted upon. So that we're not just, um, you know, having people 
shit good and hate and everything about it. So we are not doing for free with trauma um, when um, we have a career of like what we did, what we want to do, what we have the opportunity um, to help improve um, the credit of what's getting. Um, and we really want to do the relationship um, in, in this framework um, to really emphasize that, you know, uh, relationship based care is really um, a model and concept that resonates with Indigenous people. Um, it's often rooted, um, you know, having those um, close relationships are often rooted in the success of the different um, programs or approaches that were highlighted as, um, you know, a meaningful steps towards um, developing culture. And so, um, in particular, um, we also wanted to emphasize that, you know, addressing cultural safety and humility and indigenous crisis isn't, 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 um, isn't the responsibility of indigenous people. Um, but really, it does take all of us um, and working together and having indigenous tools and perspectives is absolutely vital. Um, but um, by centering indigenous people um, as, as a, in this work, um, in the way that they need the driver or they need the moment, um, can often um, shift um, that responsibility piece, which really needs to be shared. Um, and also kind of emphasizes that, um, that the focus needs to be on indigenous people. Um, and that um, takes away from the fact that um, a large part of this work is to turn the mirror around, so to speak, and start looking at ourselves um, and looking at um, Euro Christian worldview and, um, and whiteness and dominant culture and that sort of thing, um, and kind of wrestling with what those concepts mean um, and how that influences colonialism and how that has impacted Indigenous people. Um, and sure, part of, part of building relationships is for Indigenous people to also be able to share um, you know, who they are, what their worldview is, um, and um, what, you know, what really matters to them in the space, um, and to bring their culture and their strengths, uh, which there are many. Um, but oftentimes, that that's the focus where it stops, and that self inquiry piece is not done. And personal practice uses this as you know, what we call self reflective practice. So, how, how are we being, um, how are we can try to be really critical about um, our own practices, our own biases, how it may or may not be impacting our care. And so, that's yes, we have five hours written up there. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, why we wanted to, um, yeah, touch on each of these models. Mm -hmm. So, the key discussion points um, so, when healthcare providers fail to address and redress forms of racism and disability with Indigenous people to see high quality social care, um, some chronic providers appear to be unaware of certain term barriers to care for Indigenous patients, such as the disconnect from provider perception and patient experience. As an example, we, we had um, folks that from um, the same community where um, the providers um, had a different experience about um, the care being provided for Indigenous people than Indigenous community members share, um, just highlighting that there's that disconnect. Um, in order to correct other personal systemic and epistemic racism in healthcare, it is formative to talk about the approach with Indigenous and non Indigenous communities and individuals working together. So, again, the idea that uh, because this is such a pervasive and widespread issue, um, that there's multiple things, there's multiple um, things that need to be done to address it, both at the interpersonal, systemic, and epistemic levels, um, but also that we need good leadership, um, but we also need a lot of grassroots um, engagement and um, collaboration to really build meaningful solutions um, that work around. Um, and that um, having Indigenous and non Indigenous people come together and um, work together on this, you know, can be really uh, a, a practice where bridges can be built um, and um, relationships can be. Um, yeah, relationships can be nurtured. Um, I don't think of, you know, any kind of global work. It's not, um, it's an opportunity to model how we like this to look, um, you know, on the front lines, you know, in our day-to-day -day interactions. Um, and so, yeah, and so obviously when you're engaging with Indigenous cultures and engaging with Indigenous racism, it's really important to have that co-led um, and um, to incorporate Indigenous racism and Indigenous into that work. Conclusion, um, to make contact with Indigenous people who are healthy, vibrant, and self-determined. Um, and that we call upon all health providers to be part of supporting solutions identified by Indigenous interviews um, to address the impacts of colonialism on Indigenous people in health. And in order for Indigenous people to attain at home the same health expectancy as non Indigenous people, a multi household approach is required. And we don't just want, to, you know, after uh, people like Dr. Nathan Cologne to say we also don't want to just, you know, constantly just kind of meet, um, you know, meet baseline standard, then oftentimes that becomes an exhausting re relay race because the benchmark always changes. So really looking at, like, how can we attain uh, the highest level of health for Indigenous people possible um, and, and really have that be our benchmark of, of success. And um, part of this is increasing cultural awareness and humility and increasing presentation of Indigenous people all over the healthcare system. Um, and so, of course, like looking at things like the BRC calls to action um, and how we can all address, um, address the calls to action um, through upcoming um, standards developed by HSR and MHA and the Health Services Health Guide for recommendations of the impact of the work. Without these actions, the kind of health comes Indigenous and non Indigenous residents of the city are continuing to grow. grow. Um, in fact, in one of the um, FMJ's public reports, um, looking at uh, the latest census data, that although we did make um, we did uh, make improvements in much in every domain related to Indigenous health, because the improvements were so great in non Indigenous communities um, that the actual healthcare gap grew. And so, it's part of the reason I'm mentioning that, you know, if we keep on Settling for this bottom rung, this like minimum standard, it becomes an exhausting relay. Um, the time is now, and it will take all of us. And so that's the presentation. So I'll stop sharing and see if there's any questions.